just to quickly summarize, last week we said how if you want to understand the Talmud, there's like three, we gave three main points. That number one, just to quickly summarize, the number one, the Talmud's not a code of law. It's, it's not like a list of things that Jews do or Jews believe. It's really a book of opinions and ideas and it's arguments and reasoning. And it presents all kinds of ideas, not only Jewish ones, the Greek ones, Roman ones, Persian ones, all kinds of ideas from all over the place. And it discusses everything and history and philosophy and science and medicine and all kinds of things. So the Talmud has like everything in it. And it's, all, it's really just a book of ideas. And most of those ideas are rejected. And so even in the legal discussions where it presents various opinions as to how the Torah law should be interpreted, obviously you can't keep most of, you can't keep all of those opinions. Ultimately, you go with one opinion. And so by default, most of the ideas in the Talmud are actually rejected. So the Talmud's not, point number one, was that the Talmud's actually not a code of law or anything like that. And just because the Talmud says something doesn't mean that Jews actually believe it or practice it, or anything. That was point number one. Point number two, we said the Talmud's really funny. It's deliberately funny. It's full of humor, <clears throat> jokes, anecdotes, all kinds of things, sometimes silly things, and it's meant to be funny and entertaining. That was the second point. And we're going to see more examples of that today, where we see the humor in the Talmud. Yeah, that's, that's the second point. And the third point we said is that the Talmud is only one part of Judaism. Right? It's, there's so much more to Judaism than the Talmud. There's the whole Kabbalistic tradition. There's, of course, Scripture itself, first of all, the Tanakh Scripture, and then uh, all the Midrash and Kabbalah and Musar, which is like all about personal development and growth. And there's Ashkafa and like philosophy and, and actual Alakha laws. And there's so many aspects to Judaism that the Talmud is just one of them and arguably one small part of Judaism. So that was the three points that we gave last time. This time we want to address more specifically two of the biggest criticisms that people throw at the Talmud, the two biggest ones. Number one, that the Talmud is racist or elitist or says statements that are like anti-non-Jewish people. That's number one. And number two, that the Talmud talks about immoral, sexually immoral behaviors, that it promotes some kind of lewd behavior, all kinds of things that apparently it allows like underage marriage or things like that, which we all know inherently as Jews is not true because, you know, we know that this is not allowed, but yet you find on all these like anti-Semitic websites and people misquoting things or taking things out of context or just making up lies saying that the Talmud says this. So we want to address those two points about the racism point and about the, what does the Talmud really say about marriage, family life, and, you know, sexual uh, morality and things like that. So point number one, if the Talmud's racist. So I want to pr present a few quotes. The first is from Pirkei Avot, which we're all reading now. And Pirkei Avot is translated as, uh, usually as ethics of the fathers, because that's the part of the Talmud, really it's the Mishnah, that really says what our sages believed and what they <laughs> preached and how they lived. So if anybody really wants to understand our sages, that's the book that they should read. Read Pirkei Avot, read the ethics of our fathers, because then you know who they really were and what they believed and what they taught and what their ethics and morals were. So it says in chapter 3 in Pirkei Avot, Rabbi Akiva would say, Rabbi Akiva Omer, remember Rabbi Akiva is like the person who really laid out the whole structure of the Talmud, the six orders and everything. So he's probably the greatest, one of the greatest rabbis of all time. And Rabbi Akiva said, Earlier, he had actually said, I didn't bring the quote here, but Rabbi Akiva is also the one that taught when the sages debated what was the most important principle in all of Torah, what is the most important principle in all of Judaism. And Rabbi Akiva said, it's, of course, to essentially love your fellow as yourself. What is hateful to you, don't do unto others, what, what people would call the golden rule. So Rabbi Akiva actually teaches quite openly that that's the most important. If you wanted to summarize all of Judaism in one statement, this is it. Right. Treat others nicely, all other people, all human beings. Treat them. What you don't want done to you, don't do unto others. That's what Rabbi Akiva said. And a century before him, Hillel said something really similar. If you remember that story of the Gentile that wanted to convert to Judaism, and he went first to Shammai, to the school of Shammai, and we know Shammai was more of a stricter person, and he went to Shammai and he said, convert me to Judaism while standing on one foot, meaning like quickly, like while you stand on one foot, just give me like the Coles notes, just tell me what I need to know and convert me to Judaism. And Shammai said, get out of here, like you can't, you can't learn Judaism that fast, like it takes years of study to understand it. So then the person went to Hillel and he said, hey, convert me to Judaism while standing on one foot. He said, no problem. 
So he stood on one foot and he said, just, you know, treat basically this. He told him the golden rule, right? Don't do unto others what you don't want done to you or treat others nicely. And he said, and the rest is commentary. Go study, you know, <laughs> go learn. That's it. That's all of Judaism in a nutshell is that, right? Like be a, be a good person and treat all others nicely, respectfully. That's all of Judaism and the rest is commentary. Okay, so... Rabbi Akiva, this is what he says in Pirkei Avot. So he says, first of all, he starts by saying, that too much laughter and too much lightheadedness and too much, a person who's like too much partying, he's going to end up getting used to erva, to sexual sins. And then he says, that traditions are a fence for the Torah. So the way that we make sure that we don't break Torah law, to keep Torah law, we put a fence around it and traditions our offense to make sure that we keep Torah law and that we don't break Torah law. And ma'asarot sayagla osher, that charity, tithes, is a fence for wealth. So if you want to be wealthy, it might seem counterintuitive, but give more to charity. The more charity you give, the more wealthy you are. And be, why? Because the Torah actually says this clearly. God makes, gives you a promise. Uh, we know that in general, you're not allowed to test God. Right? You're not allowed to test God. You're not allowed to say, if God does this for me, then I'll do this. Right? God, give me a miracle, and then I'll do this. Like, then I'll be religious. Show me a sign. You can't do it. You can't test God. However, there's one thing in the Tanakh where God says, this you can test me on. The prophet Malachi says, he said, God, he quotes God as saying, Have you at kol el bet Bring your charity, bring your tithes, and make sure, teref beveti, make sure there's food in my house, Make sure that, you know, for our, for our day and age, it would mean that there's food for poor people and so on. Give your money to charity. And then God says, Ufchanuni na bezot. You can go ahead and he says, please test me. Right? Amar Hashem. You can test me. He says, na means like, please test me. Like, try it out. See, it's, I guarantee you, God says, Im lo lachem et If you do this, I will open for you all the treasures of heaven, and I will bless you endlessly. So in this thing, God said, you can test me. And you'll see, if you start giving more to charity, to worthy causes, of course, today there's a lot of charities that are not worthy, but if you give to a worthy cause, then God actually promises you more wealth. So Rabbi Akiva is really basing himself on that, that he's saying, that if you're going to, that giving to charity is actually a fence for wealth, for, to protect your wealth. And then he says, Nedarim sayagla prishut, making vows is a fence for abstinence, prishut of being a little, for like asceticism, like make vows and then you'll be able to abstain from things, vices and things like that, which we want to avoid. And he says, sayagla chokma shtika, an offense for wisdom is silence. So if you want to be smart, you know, keep your mouth shut, right? It's better to not talk. It's better to listen and not talk. You know, a sign of wisdom is actually a person who can listen and not talk too much. So that, that's the introduction to Rabbi Akiva's statement. And then he says this regarding our point of, did the sages, did they have like some kind of racist view of the world? So he says, Rabbi Akiva would say, that beloved is man, mankind, because we were all created in God's image. And he says, and it's even more amazing and loving of God that he told us that we were made in his image. Okay? Because the Torah says, Ki Elohim adam, that God made all of humanity in his image. And so we are all beloved by God. So that's, it's clear what Rabbi Akiva is saying, right? All human beings are made in God's image. All human beings are beloved by God. And then he just qualifies that by saying, how is Israel different? How are the Jewish people different from the rest of mankind? So Israel is just unique, Rabbi Akiva is saying, is because God calls us in the Torah, his children specifically, as if we're like God's children. And as it says in Deuteronomy, Banim atem Elohechem. God clearly told the, the Israelites when he took them out of Egypt that you are like my children. Okay. So it's clear. All of mankind is beloved by God. The difference 
of the, the, the view here is that the Jewish people are just were chosen, so to speak. And so we are unique in that sense, that we're like God's representatives on earth or supposed to be. A Jew who's actually doing what he's supposed to is supposed to be God's representative on earth. But both are beloved. All of mankind is beloved by God. And really, there's many verses across the Tanakh and even in the Talmud that talk about how the Jewish people ultimately were a nation among other nations and God loves everybody. And there's one pasuk in particular, which is amazing, in, in Amos, in the prophet Amos, he says, God is saying, you the Israelites, like, why do you guys think you're so special? There's a little chastisement here. You guys think you're so special? He says, you're no different to me than the Ethiopians, than the Kushim, than the black people. Right? You Israelites and the black people, I made both of you. You're all the same to me. Right? That's what God is saying. And then the verse continues and says, Halo et Israel eliti You I took out of Egypt. Israel I took out of Egypt. Uflishtim mi kaftor. But I took the Philistines from kaftor. And I took the Aram Mikir, and I brought the Arameans from Kir. So God is basically saying, I created all these nations. I move people around. I create these borders. I create these people. Right? So in my view, you're all the same. So you have such verses in the Tanakh. By the, as a side point, by the way, you know that there's this like black Hebrews movement, this like black Israelites, and they're trying to argue some of these. I get a lot of these comments from them on YouTube, and they're so ridiculous. And some of them are trying to argue that the original Israelites were black, you know, and they were all black, and Moses was black, and whatever. The Ethiopians will say that they're right? No, no, no. Ethiopian, yes. Jews, <laughs> Ethiopian Jews are legit Jews. We're talking about people who have... No, no, no. The Ethiopian Jews are legitimate Jews. We're talking about these black Israelites who are arguing that Jews today, like white Jews are imposters. They're not real. The real Jews, the authentic Jews, are black people. They're not right. Because this verse, this verse... This verse obviously proves that they're wrong because God is saying, he's, he's right. comparing, he's saying you Jewish people to me are like those black people. Don't think you are better than them. Plus with Moshe, they claim, oh, Moses was originally black. It says about Moses that he married another wife who was a Kushit. And that seemed to be a problem. And Miriam criticized him for it. Like, why did you take a black wife? Right? Which implies that Moses wasn't black. Right? And Miriam has, if you read the pshat of the story there, it seemed like Miriam was a little bit racist because she's like, hey, Moses, what the hell? Why did you marry a black woman? And her punishment was that she became metzorah keshaleg, the metzorat keshaleg, that she became white like snow, that God made, gave her leprosy so that she became super white. I mean, the pshat is like, it's pretty clear what the simple meaning of the story here. It's interpreted in various ways, but the simple reading of the story is clear. Miriam criticizes Moses for marrying a black woman and so her punishment is to be so leprous that she's ultra white, like snow. Meaning like, oh, you think you're so white? Okay, here, let me make you even whiter, right? And you'll have leprosy. That's like clearly the shadow of the story. But obviously it means that Moses wasn't black and Miriam wasn't black and the Israelites weren't black. Moses happened to take another black wife who was a Kushit, which was weird for them, right? And so the Torah highlights that story to show like, don't be racist. Moses' second wife was black. And although according to the Midrash, she was actually his first wife. But before he married Zipporah, he had a black wife too. He did? Yeah. Yeah. Well, some people say that Zipporah was, it was the same one wife that she was, whatever it is. She was called a Kushit for whatever. Zipporah, Moses' wife. Yeah. Some hold that it was the same person. But the shot is that he had two wives, that he had a second wife. And like the Arizal and the Midrash talk about that, that before he met Zipporah... She was actually a queen or princess of Ethiopia, of Kush. Yeah. On his way to Midian, he met an Ethiopian. He lived in actually in Kush for a while. Before, before, before he, he got to Before even that, when he ran away from Egypt. Remember when he, as a young man, he ran away from Egypt? So first stop closest to Egypt is Ethiopia. So first he actually ended up in Ethiopia. And there he met his first wife. Yeah. He, became, he was a warrior. He became a general. And then he went all the way up to the point where he married a princess and wow. so on. That was amazing. Yeah. How, yeah. Long after, how long yeah. after he left Egypt did he arrive at the burning bush? Like, he was 80 at the burning bush already. So he left he Egypt left. when he was perhaps either 20 or 40. We're not sure. But wow. whichever opinion you go to, either 40 years or 60 years, he was away from Egypt. So what happened in those intervening 40, 60 years? 
So there's a whole Midrash that he, first he lived in Kush in Ethiopia and he was a general there and then from Kush he left and then he went to Midian and then he met Jethro and married his daughter Zipporah and there's like all this other stories. The Torah says he actually stopped being intimate with his wife anyways. So it wasn't like with Zipporah. So anyway, it's, it's a whole difficult story. The Arizal has beautiful interpretations of it, of what did it mean and uh, that he had this black wife and so on. And the Arizal holds that he had two distinct wives. One was Tsipora and one was this black lady. If I'm not mistaken, the term Kushi in modern Hebrew has a particular connotation. Right. But it sounds like a description of a location. Yeah, throughout Torah and Talmud, Kushi is not a bad word. It's not a derogatory word. It just means a black person. Today, like the N-word in the United States, which originally was not a bad word, but now, because of the way it was used, it's become derogatory. So today in Israel, kushi is derogatory, but, in, but it's used all the time in Tanakh and in Talmud. As just, that is the word for an Ethiopian. Yeah, exactly. There's no other word for it. There's no other word for a black person in, in the Torah. It's, Ethiopia is kush, yeah. Kush is Ethiopia, yeah. Would you agree that the us Jews were darker skinned? Listen, my, I did my 23andMe genetic analysis, and it showed me that I'm basically 99% like Middle Eastern from Mesopotamia and that region where like Abraham would have been from. Mm-hmm. So I imagine Abraham would have had my skin tone. I don't know Ashkenazi back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you're going back to the same question I said. The yeah. Jews are black. There are legitimate black Jews, yeah, yeah, like yeah. Ethiopians and, Ju- and black people who converted to Judaism. Like Nisim Black, the rapper. He's a legitimate Jew. Well, I want to ask something. Yeah. I think it was pretty explicit by saying that, that Itro came with his, you know, he says to Moshe, you know, here's your wife and your kids. You right. Know? So, that was before. So that was before. Now that, that was in that. Sefer Shmot. Right. Now this is already in Bamidbar. Right. right. Now that there's, and while when they're already in the wilderness later, now there's suddenly this, the Torah says he had a black wife. And Miriam is like, what, what's going on? Why did you? Either she was upset that he didn't tell her that he had a black wife, or she was upset that he stopped being intimate with Zipporah. There's different ways to interpret it. The Torah doesn't say exactly what the problem was. So, yeah, depending on which way you go. But according to the Midrash and the Arizal, and that he, he had two distinct wives. And one was black. So. And Josephus even actually mentions this as well. So even the historian Josephus. So he what? What, what does he say? That Moses had a black wife. But, but the, and I think he calls, he, he names wife? her, he names her as Tharbis. That was her name. Uh-huh. But he's not, he's not referring to Tzipora. Not Tzipora. Right. Not Tzipora. Right. So going back to this idea that, okay, all humanity are God's creations. God loves all of mankind. And that's a fundamental principle of Judaism. And probably one of the most famous descriptions of this is in the Talmud in Sanhedrin, where it says after the splitting of the sea, you remember what happened? The Jewish people crossed the sea, the Egyptians drowned, and the Jews started, the Israelites started singing. They sang Shirat Ayam, the song of the sea. And we sing this song all the time, right? It's in our prayers. We sing it regularly in Shachrit. And so this is what the Talmud says, that uh, that the angels wanted to sing as well, and God told them, Amar lehen HaKadosh Baruch Hu, God told them, Ma'asei yadai tov'in bayam, my works, my, the work of my hands are drowning in the sea, ve'atem omrim shira lefanai, and you want to sing? Right? So God chastised the angels, saying, how could you sing? This is a sad moment. This is a tragedy. The Egyptians are drowning in the sea. Yes, for the Israelites, it was a happy moment. They were saved, and the Egyptian, the, the Egyptian pursuers drowned in the sea. But in the heavens, God was sad. Saying the Egyptians, I had to drown the Egyptians to save the Israelites. Right? So the angels wanted to sing, and God said, "No, that's not. This is not the time to sing." Right? So the and the Talmud has such passages that are obviously clear that we we value and, and respect all mankind. We are all made in God's image. Okay. What is the reason? I don't know. People point out like other passages, other certain passages. certain passages that talk about idolaters deserving death and things like that. But, you know, such passages you find in all monotheistic religions, in Islamic texts, in Christian texts, because idolatry was like the big, uh, what's the word, impediment, roadblock, op- opponent to monotheism, to Judaism. So there, are, there will be such statements. And sometimes the Talmud has, again, humorously will make certain statements. 
not just about Gentiles and idolaters, but even about Jews. There's a place in the Talmud that says, Ameha Aretz, meaning Jews who are ignorant, like non-religious ignorant Jews, they should also be killed. Why? Because they are sinners. Ultimately what happens, the idolaters are big sinners, and the ignorant Jews, also unfortunately, they don't know God's law, and they're gonna end up sinning. So even they, they deserve, you know, and then, but that Talmud continues and says, no, no, don't think that way. You should go and teach them, right? And somebody who teaches them will have a huge reward in heaven. Like, fix the problem. You see people who are idolaters or are not religious, don't make them religious, right? Show them, teach them God's law. So the Talmud has statements like that. So if you take it out of context, if you take that one line, it seems like, oh, what is this? This is crazy. How could it say such a thing? But if you understand it in its proper context, then it makes sense. And ultimately, the Talmud says in many places that you have to, of course, we, we value all mankind. Okay, two pages earlier, it says in Sanhedrin as well, very famous verse that we've all heard. It says that it, the Torah says when Cain killed Abel, when Cain killed Abel, the Torah says, Dmei achicha tzoakim, that God said, the bloods of your brother are screaming out to me from the ground, right? And the Talmud asks, why does it say Dmei? Why not Dam? It should say the blood of your brother. Why does it say the bloods? So it says that Dmei refers to all of his progeny and all of his descendants because when you killed Abel, you also killed any potential children and grandchildren he would have had. So all the bloods of all those potentials you cut off. And it continues and says, adam yechidi. This is why God made man singular. God made one man at the beginning. He created the world and he made one man. Why? To teach you, that anybody who kills one soul, it's a, one human, it's as if he killed an entire world. Because originally there was only one person and the whole world. So when you kill one person, it's as if you killed the whole world. That's why God made mankind starting from one person and not many people, to teach you that lesson. And similarly, anybody and anybody who uh, saves one soul, and if you save one soul, it's as if you saved the entire world. And it keeps going, and, and it also has a beautiful little story that says, uh, How great is God? When a person mints coins, you have one, whatever it is, the, the, the one stamp or whatever it is, the, the main mint, I guess. When you, you mint it all from one, like, uh, thing, and they, all the coins are the same. But, but God, the King of Kings, we are all made in the image of the first man, in the image of God, and yet, and yet we are all different. All human beings are different, we look different, we have different skin colors, we have different whatever. And it actually concludes by saying, every human, every person, should say to himself, that the world exists, was created for me, that I am worth the whole world. Right? So this is a very uplifting, inspiring message that every human being, you shouldn't feel depressed, you shouldn't feel like your life is meaningless, especially today when there's so much pressure to make your life seem meaningless, when the whole secular education system is designed to make children feel like they are worthless, meaningless, they're just advanced chimpanzees that came from random mutations over billions of years and there's no actual purpose to their life. They are just an assembly of molecules and their life is meaningless. Their identity is meaningless. They can be whatever they want. And where you have now even assisted suicide, even for kids, you want to kill yourself? No problem. We'll help you. And the whole Western education system is designed to make people feel worthless and, and useless. And the Talmud is saying the exact opposite. You're made in the image of God. You are an entire world to yourself. And every human being should say every day, Bishvili, remind yourself, Bishvili nivra ha'olam, that the world exists for me, that I am important, that the whole world exists and for my sake. For even one person, the world's important. So it's, it's a very beautiful message. Last thing, it's the Midrash says, the Midrash is parallel to the Talmud. It's not the Talmud, but it, there's a lot of overlap. And the Midrash was written at the same time. It's an ancient rabbinic text. The Midrash says, this is like the final word on it. God is really declaring this and saying, I bring heaven and earth to, to bear witness that. That doesn't matter if you're a Gentile or a Jew. 
a man or a woman, ben eved ben shifcha, or a slave, or a maidservant. Everything depends on a person's own actions. So, it doesn't matter who you are. Jew, Gentile, man, woman, slave, free person, doesn't matter. It all depends on your actions. You're a good person, the Divine Spirit rests upon you. That's what the Midrash says. And that's, that's the fu- fundamental belief of Judaism, right? So there's no, there's no place for any kind of racism or elitism really in Judaism because all people are equal and it all depends on their... Everybody has the same potential at birth and it all depends on their actions of where they end up. Now, the Midrash says, Bein goy, bein Israel. So just as a side note, in the same way we mentioned Kushim, that it's used derogatorily, derogatorily today. Uh, the word goy, people think it's a derogatory term, which it isn't. Goy just means a nation. Right? So it's completely harmless and it's not derogatory at all. It just means, literally just means Gentile, means nation. And even the Jewish people are called a goy. Right. The Torah calls us goy kadosh, the holy nation or the separated nation. Kadosh literally means separated. The distinct nation. But we're also called a goy. So it's not, goy is not a derogatory term at all. Because even the Jewish people are referred to it, to a goy, a nation. Just means nation. And Abaya says, another one, that the, the Talmud says that Abaya would always teach, Leolam yihe adam arum a person should always be fearing, God-fearing, openly God-fearing. Umar shalom im echav, and should make peace with all of his brothers. Ve'im krovav, and all of his close people. Ve'im kol adam, and all humans. Ve'afilu im goy bashuk. Even with a Gentile in the market, at the grocery store, even people you don't know, you should be very nice to them and you should make peace with them. Right? Why? Kidei she'yeh auv lemala, so that you will be beloved above in heaven. Ve'nechmad lemata. And beloved charming down below, so that people will like you, so that they will love you upstairs in the heavens, and they will love you downstairs below. Ve'yeh mekubal ala briot, right? So that all living things will be happy with you and like you. And that's what a person should strive to be and to do all the time. And it says there that Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai, who was the president of the Sanhedrin, sometime after Hillel, he was a student of Hillel and was the, a president of the Sanhedrin later on, it says <clears throat> about him, adam shalom goy bashuk, that Rabban Yochanan was such a pleasant person that he always made sure to be the first to greet everybody. Everybody that he met outside, he would greet them, hi, how are you, and so on. Even somebody who didn't know, even a stranger in the market, even a goy bashuk, he would make sure that he always sought, asked them about their welfare, how they're doing, and was nice to them, and greeted them with a smile. The president of the Sanhedrin. Right? So that's, that's, what we, that's the kind of person that we strive to be. And some of the anti-Semites will say, oh, the Talmud says you're allowed to deceive non-Jewish people. It's not true. Again, the Talmud says, Amar Shmuel, asur lignov da'at abriyot ve'afilu da'ato shel ovet kochavim. It's forbidden to deceive anybody. Any of the briot, it's forbidden to deceive even an idolater. Even an idolater. You're not allowed to deceive anybody. You have to treat everybody fairly and respectfully and so on. I want to make a side point. The verse that I quoted before about saving a person saving the whole world, killing a person, like killing the whole world. In some versions of the Talmud today, it says, nefesh achat Israel, that this only applies if you save somebody from the Jewish people. And that's where some of the anti-Semitic sites use this verse. But that's an incorrect girsa version of the Talmud. It's obvious that it's incorrect because it makes no sense in the context. It's talking about Cain and Abel, who obviously weren't Jewish. And it's talking about briot, which means all of mankind. And it says kol echad ve'echad and so on. So the language there is talking about all mankind. So there is an incorrect text of this Talmud that says Misrael. So just to keep that in mind, there is a misquoting or a, of a misprinting of the Talmud as well. That it's important. That word does not belong there. And it doesn't even make sense in the context. Okay, so that was point number one. Uh, point number two about all the matters of like sexuality and lewd behavior and that the Torah somehow, or the Talmud preaches like whatever, people tie it into the left-wing LGBTQ transgender agenda, which of course is completely opposed to what the Talmud stands for. And the Talmud says this. I'm just going to po- pointing out some of the passages that I particularly like. Any man who doesn't have a wife, 
שרוי בלא שמחה. He ha- is without happiness. A man without a wife is an unhappy man. בלא ברכה, has no blessing, בלא טובה, has no goodness. And then it explains how we know, because it derives it from verses in the Torah. בלא שמחה, because it's written, ושמחת אתה ובתיך. When you get married, you shall be happy, you shall glad, be glad, and so on. So it gives proofs for each of these things. And then, במערבה, in the West, the sages of the West would add, בלא תורה and בלא חומה, that he, a person without a wife, has no Torah, and also has no, no real Torah learning. And Belo Choma, without a wall of protection. So a, a woman like, is like a protective wall. A, a wife is a protective wall to her husband. And then Rava Bar Ula Amar, and then Rava adds Belo Shalom. A man without a wife is a man without peace. And then Tanu Rabbanan, the sage is taught, however tishtoke gufo, that a person should love his wife <coughs> like he loves himself. And Vermechabda yoter mi gufo, but he should honor her and respect her more than he respects and honors himself. So right away the question is, why do you have to love her like yourself, but honor her more? Why not like love her more and honor her as much as yourself? So the truth is that you're never going to love somebody more than you love yourself. By default, every human is going to love himself the most. You're going to always forgive yourself, and you're always going to see yourself positively. So even if you say you don't, you will. Just by default, it's human nature. You're going to love yourself the most. So love your spouse like you love yourself, at least that much. And then, but, but you should honor her even more. Right? Because with honor, you can reduce your honor, but you should honor her more than you honor yourself. And you should, and you should guide your children, educate your children to walk the righteous path, make them righteous. And you should marry your children off when they're not too old, when they're like in puberty, okay, not too old, because, why? Because, you know what happens when teenagers start, you know, all their hormones and they start messing around and then they ruin their lives. So the Talmud says, you know, don't wait too long to get married. Get married younger uh, because before you do all this nonsense and like, and, 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 and contaminate yourself. You know, you're, once you already have those urges, you might as well like marry your high school sweetheart and, you know, and that's actually what King Solomon said, right? King Solomon said, you should marry your first love and live a good life with your first love. Uh, that's ideal, anyways. So marry them when they're younger. Now, what's young? So this is where you have some like anti-Semites say, oh, the Talmud says, you, you know, allows underage marriage or things like that. It doesn't. I mean, the Mishnah says that the best, the ideal age for marriage is Shmona Yisrael Lechupa. It's in Pirkei Avot, that the ideal age for marriage is technically 18. What the law is, and this is where, again, the Talmud is not the code of law, Something like the Mishnah Torah is the code of law. So what does the code of Jewish law actually state about marriage and the age of marriage? It says like this. This is from the Rambam, from Sefer Nashim, the actual law. It's a mitzvah for a man to in- get engaged by himself. Meaning, more than, yoter it's better than having an agent make an engagement. Yeah, it's not quite a shidduch, but it's saying like, don't, it's better not to have somebody, an agent, go and p- create an engage, arrange a marriage and engage, make an engagement for you. It's better for you to, to whatever, propose to a woman and, and make an engagement yourself. And then, v'chen mitzvah le'isha she'tekadesh atzma be'yada. So also for the woman, she should be like, the man and woman should be there together and make an engagement and not to do it through a shaliach, through an agent. So this, this is a consensual element here. Of course, and but and it's going to explain. And although there is permission on a Torah level for a father to arrange a marriage for his daughter, when she is young, when she's a minor, it's permitted technically. But it's, we shouldn't do that. Like rabbinically, it's not allowed to do. So the mitzvah is that a man cannot arrange a marriage for his daughter until she is grown up, until she is shetagdil, until she is of an age of majority. And when she herself will say, leploni, to a particular person, I want to marry this man. This is the law. She has to be a grown, mature woman. 
And she has to say of her own accord, I want, this is the man that I love, I want to marry this man. That's the law. Of course, this is what Jewish law actually states. Now, can I ask a question? There's, I think there's a train of thought somewhere that a man should get married before he, I mean, they state, uh, or you know, bought a house or whatever. It is. Yes. So has yeah. achieved some some level of independence yeah. from his parents or whatever. Yeah, yeah, that's also the Talmud that says that first you have to plant, uh, get a house, plant a, uh, whatever a farm, and then our vineyard, right. and then get married. Right. You have so to have talking, financial we're yeah. stability yeah. and a trade. Right. right. And then, Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So I'm going to skip uh, a large section of why the Talmud does say in certain places about why, where that opinion actually comes from, where the Talmud talks about potentially underage marriage. But I'm going to skip that for now. We'll leave it for another time because we're running out of time and this is going to, it's a longer discussion of where that actual opinion comes from. We need like a good half an hour to address it. But the, the law is clear. Jewish law is clear. A woman should not be married, cannot be, a father cannot even arrange a marriage for her when she's a, a minor. She has to have reached the age of majority and she has to want to get married. And it, even in other places it says that she has to point to the man, like literally point to him and say, this man I want to marry. Right? This is the one I want to marry. And then, so that's the idea. To us, it's obvious that obviously Judaism is built all around the marriage, the family unit and having like a wholesome uh, a marriage and family. And that whole metaphor of the husband and wife and the children is used throughout Kabbalistic literature as a metaphor for the whole cosmos and the whole, our whole reality and explaining the relationship between God and the Jewish people and mankind and, and, and the heavens and the earth. So it's fundamental to Judaism, of course, that traditional family, the nuclear family is the, the foundational blueprint of all of Judaism, really. And so people say the Talmud is like somehow promiscuous, but of course the Talmud is the exact opposite. The Talmud only adds even more fences and restrictions. So the Torah lists a whole bunch of restricted prohibitions, of prohibited relationships. The Talmud adds even more to that. It actually doubles the count of who you're prohibited from being with. You know, the Torah says you're not allowed to be with a, a man is not allowed to be intimate with a menstruating woman. The Talmud adds another week on top of that, right? You can't be with a woman that's menstruating plus another week. So we're just adding even more restrictions. The Torah doesn't say anything about masturbation. The Torah doesn't prohibit masturbation. The Talmud does. Right? So the Talmud adds all kinds of restrictions on top of... It alludes to it, though. It alludes to it. I mean, with, with people Yudas, interpret... With Yudas, the, son, yes, says, people says, interpret Yudas, the story of Er, Benef, of, Benef, yeah, of er and Onan, yeah. but that's not talking about masturbation. What they did was they avoided no, impregnating. It's, it's Zerar Levatala, but right. it's not masturbation. Right? They avoided impregnating her. So that's a different story. And each one had his own sin of why he didn't want it. So the, the sin there was not fulfilling the mitzvah of reproduction. But are those, are those reasons, they're not mentioned in the Torah. They're basically... It's implied by the text. Right. Right? So anyway, we'll leave that aside. But the Talmud adds many more prohibitions to uh, what the Torah says. So the Talmud, is, it's not, not only is it not promiscuous, it's actually even more sexually reserved and, and more prohibitive than what the Torah says. And the Torah allows polygamy also, and the Talmud heavily frowns upon it. There's basically no cases of polygamy in the Talmud, maybe one, uh, but you'll basically find pretty much, except for maybe one, there, none of the sages were polygamous. Uh, from the Talmud already, Judaism was very much <clears throat> monogamous. And in Masechet Yevamot, it actually says, Rabbi, Rabbi Ami says, Kol ishto, if a person marries a woman on top of his wife, a second wife, ten ktuba, that he has to divorce the first one. That he would, he would even forbid, already back in the Talmud days, if you try to get a second wife, according to Rabbi Ami, you got to go and divorce the first one. Can't have two wives. So, in short, uh, the Talmud is definitely very reserved, very modest sexually, adds even more prohibitions to the Torah, and preaches proper, like, wholesome marriage, monogamous marriage, and proper families, of course. And... I'll conclude with a story. The Talmud does sometimes talk about, not sometimes, in many places the Talmud will talk about various sexual matters and some of them seem strange, some of them seem funny. And we said last time that the Talmud doesn't shy away from uncomfortable discussions. It'll address all aspects of life. And it's also very funny. So I want to just give this story. It says about Rav Kahana that he went and he hid under his rabbi's bed. Okay? And... Shamea, he heard his rabbi being with his wife. He didn't watch, but he, that, that would be very wrong. But he, he hid under the bed and he heard 
like what was going on in the bedroom of his rabbi. And he couldn't hold himself and he blurted something out. And he blurted something funny. He said, it sounds like my rabbi has never... Uh, it's as if like he's never, he's never eaten. It's, yeah, he was very passionate, it sounded like. And it's like he's never eaten a, a meal. And, and of course, the rabbi heard and he said, Kahana, is that you? Right? What are you doing here? Right? Are you crazy? So he told him, get out of here. Like, what's wrong with you? Right? But this is the response. This is how the story ends. That Rav Kahana said, Amar le Torah hi this is also Torah. This is also an aspect of Torah. And I need to learn it because I need to learn how to be with my wife. Like, how do I, you know, please my wife, satisfy my wife? I need to learn this too. Who's going to teach me this? Right? So, so obviously a very funny story, uh, but it's designed to also teach like the idea that we take this very seriously and, and we, the, the whole husband wife relationship. But the sages are always very reserved in this regard, and they summarize it with one statement, which is in Masachat Sukkah, Ever katan yesh lo adam, that every man has a small organ, ma'arivo savea, if you starve it, it's satisfied, u'masbiyo ra'ev, and if you satisfy it, it's starving. Okay? So every man has a little organ. If you starve the organ, it'll be satisfied. And if you always satisfy that organ, it'll always be starving for more. The more you give in to that urge, the more you're going to want, and it's going to drag you into a very bad place. So it's better to limit it. And then it actually goes on to give various tips of how to stop that urge, how to defeat that yetzerara, that evil inclination that might pull you towards sin. Tana de Rabbi Ishmael, im paga becha menuval if that scoundrel, the evil inclination, the Satan, comes and tries to get you to sin, what do you do? It says, Mashcheu leveta midrash, pull him into the study hall. Go and learn Torah, because the Torah has this power to defeat the evil inclination. The Torah subdues the evil inclination, so when you learn Torah and when you learn Talmud in particular, it actually helps you defeat the evil inclination and calms you down. And uh, in another place, it says in Sifrei that God told the Jewish people, Banai, barati lechem God says, I created the evil inclination, barati lechem Torah tavlin, and I gave you the Torah as its antidote. So Torah study will also defeat the Yetzirah. So if you feel like the evil inclination, this is truly for anything. Anytime you feel like that little devil on your shoulder is trying to pull you to some kind of sin, then go and study Torah and Talmud, because Torah and Talmud study actually defeats the Yetzirah. To the extent that, another funny story, again, just seeing the humor in the Talmud, to the extent that it says in, in Masechet Yevamot that Rav Huna had 60 students, and they learned Torah so much, they learned so much Talmud, it literally made them impotent. That's what it says. Right? So another humorous remark in the Talmud, that 60 of Rav Huna's students became impotent because of all their Talmud learning, because they subdued the Yetzirah so deeply that they didn't have any desire whatsoever. Right? They completely destroyed, exactly. And again, obviously it's meant to be a humorous statement. Right? They learned so much that they became impotent. So, but the idea is that it does have the power to quell those kinds of urges. So if you do feel the, sin for, the urge to sin in any kind of way, Actually, Torah study and Talmud study will defeat it. Okay, that's the idea. I think that's just like enough, enough samples of, from across the Talmud, and there's so many more that shows, just to summarize it, of course the Talmud is not racist or elitist in any way, and there are some statements that could be interpreted that way out of context, but that's really not its meaning. And the Talmud is saying that all of mankind is, is worthy and should be respected and is made in the image of God. And we treat everybody the way we want to be treated and we have to treat everybody respectfully and love everybody and so on. And the family unit is so important to us. And having a wholesome marriage, monogamous marriage, and raising our kid, children properly and so on. So that's really what the Talmud stands for. Uh, for us to, to really be righteous. That's, and if anybody really wants to understand what our sages wanted of us, read Pirkei Avot, read the ethics of the fathers, because that really says what our ethic is. And then you'll see over there that it's all about being as righteous as possible, as godly as possible, as just as possible, as holy as possible. Right? That's, that's what we're here for. Okay, we'll end it there. Yeah.